When you start taking testosterone, whether it's a shot or a gel, your own production will stop. There will be testicular atrophy and infertility. That means spermatogenesis is pretty much stopped. Now, again, these things can be reversible once you stop, and that's kind of what all those clinics are promising, saying, yeah, you can be on this for a while. We're going to bump your testosterone levels up. You're going to feel great. You're going to make more gains in the gym. You're going to have more energy. Of course, all these things are true. But the question is always, does it return to normal? And you know, there are cases when it does not. And no one can really tell you what percentage of people don't get back to their baseline when they stop taking exogenous testosterone, right? I did a video about it. You're going to see it right here about the risks of young men starting testosterone, which in my opinion is a big mistake. But the industry, you know, is very strong here and they're suggesting this, hey, you're going to feel better. This is the greatest thing for men. But what we're really causing is, you know, massive amounts of infertility down the line, right? And then the question is, is that something that we really need? And, you know, I would argue not. I think as long as you're still planning to have children at one point in your life, you should preserve your fertility as long as you can. This is my opinion. Now, are there alternatives to this? Because it is very true that, you know, if our testosterone levels are very low, you know, we're at the low end of the spectrum here, let's say men are like around 300 nanograms per deciliter or lower, right? And our free testosterone is low, then of course we have some symptoms, you know, feeling tired, not getting the stuff done we want in, in our work and all these things, you know, libido is down, all these kind of things can happen. Then, of course, there's a consideration saying, hey, what do I do to solve this? You know, I want to feel better. And then the easiest option is, of course, to jump on testosterone replacement therapy. And let's face it, those clinics are everywhere, right? Now, um, there is, I think, a much better alternative to this. Now, first, we have to distinguish, um, is the testosterone low because of a primary or secondary hypogonadism? And the primary form, that is actually something that is very, very rare, uh, that means basically that the testes themselves don't work very well. And that is hardly ever the case. It's a very, very rare occurrence that happens sometimes. In that case, of course, you have to replace with testosterone. There's no other option, right? Similar to a uh, type 1 diabetic, right? So type 1 diabetes, you just don't make any insulin. You got to get it in. Otherwise, you know, you can't you know, absorb sugars from your bloodstream. Um, so there are some similarities in that respect. Now, most uh, uh, people suffering from low, most men suffering from low testosterone are is suffering because of secondary hypogonadism. Now, secondary hypogonadism just really means that the testes are functional, but um, the hypothalamus and pituitary are not sufficiently stimulating the testes to make testosterone, right? And the, the signaling pathway is somehow not quite there, and so that's why the testosterone levels are low, right? Now, um, again, this is something where testosterone is a very blunt instrument. So if we just give testosterone, we are bumping up the total testosterone, um, then, of course, the free testosterone, which does most of the work. Now, remember, only uh, 2% of your total testosterone is free testosterone. That does actually most of the work that testosterone is supposed to do, binds the receptors, stimulates muscle growth, you know, gives us more energy and all these kind of things. It's a bit antiquated to say that 98% is completely unusable. That is actually not quite true, but it's bound for at least for a little while and it's less usable, I would say, I think, to just to keep it very simple here. So... When we just give testosterone, we bump the levels up, fine. But then again, we have all these side effects, right? What are other side effects of just giving testosterone? You can also, of course, mess up your um, cholesterol levels, right? So your cholesterol can get out of whack, especially, you know, your HDL cholesterol, which we want to be on the higher side, that can actually drop pretty low. And that happens frequently in testosterone replacement. Hair loss, of course, is another one. And so these are all symptoms that can happen during testosterone replacement. And guess what? There's medications for that as well. So the pharmacy is like, hey, listen, this is great. Now we can sell you a uh, finasteride and now we can sell you a statin, you know? So you're going to have a bunch of uh, pharmaceuticals. Fertility is uh, pretty much gone at this point. And uh, we know this since the 70s or 80s in Sweden. I think it was the 1970s. Researchers tried to find the birth control pill for the man. <laughs> and it was essentially it was giving men 100 milligrams of testosterone once a week. And they found it was about 97% effective. So 97% of men um, had uh, spermatogenesis suppressed sufficiently that they were infertile, so they would prevent pregnancy. And, and you know, of course, they found out that the birth control pill is more than 99% effective, and so they went with that. They said that's probably the better way to go. But anyway, so we, we've known this for a while. This is not a, this is not a secret, right, that we have a, a decreased fertility. Now, does it mean that all men on testosterone replacement therapy are infertile? No, of course not. So you should not assume that because you are on testosterone replacement therapy that you don't need birth control. So that's actually a very important point to consider here. So anyway, so again, testosterone, very blunt instrument, cause all these problems. 
Now, uh, clomiphene or clomid is something that has been used for a while uh, in men that come off testosterone replacement therapy. And um, it is often used, you know, again, to restart the um, hypothalamus pituitary axis in order to stimulate um, spermatogenesis and testosterone production in the testes after men stop taking TRT. Because after someone comes off of re testosterone replacement, as I mentioned before, it's going to take a while uh, until, you know, men come back to baseline production of testosterone and that spermatogenesis is starting again. And again, in some cases, it doesn't start at all. That's very rare, of course, but it does happen or it starts sluggish or doesn't get back to the point where it was. So you might only be at, let's say, 80% or 70% later from the point when you started your testosterone replacement therapy. And I think that is, of course, very concerning, right? So, so Clomid was given and that had, unfortunately, a few side effects because it has actually two enantiomers in there and that's enclomiphene and then zuclomiphene. And I want to talk about what the difference between these two things are. But um, this was used, not a great medication in my opinion. Sometimes HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin was used just to restart the whole process and work to some extent. But I never thought that these were very good medications because I don't think they would bring, um, you know, levels back to totally normal. <clears throat> now, for a while, I mean, you know, a few years ago, I was uh, using testosterone replacement therapy in my clinic. I personally have never, have never done it, even though my labs, I would say, are kind of like middle of the road there, a little bit under actually, you know, and uh, so if I went to another clinic, they would probably say, hey, if you want to, you can start this, right? Um, I don't have any symptoms of low testosterone. So at this point, I chose definitely not to do it. And hence, I'm doing this video also explaining why most men actually probably should wait on this or again, use something else. And we're going to talk about that. So clomiphene, not great, but n clomiphene, and that is just one of these enantiomers. That's about 62% of clomid, of, of clomiphene. The other 38% um, is zuclomiphene. That's the one that's actually an um, estrogen agonist. That's actually something that can cause estrogenic side effects. And that's why I don't like clomid, right? But n is an estrogen blocker. And I'm going to talk about why that's important and how that can boost testosterone and fertility. So it can boost spermatogenesis and uh, your, your testosterone levels up at the same time. So the um, n clomiphene is the part, again, that is only blocking um, the estrogen um, receptors. So that means it kind of blocks the signaling to the, to the brain that estrogen levels are at sufficient amounts. And it tricks the brain into thinking, you know what, I don't have enough of this. What's the solution here? The brain is sending signals via the hypothalamus and then relayed by the pituitary gland down to the testes to increase testosterone production and spermatogenesis, right? But this does not, again, n clomiphene does not have any um, estrogen uh, uh, estrogenic side effect itself, right? So it actually is only really reestablishing the healthy production of testosterone and also spermatogenesis. So I think it's actually a very good medication in that regard, right? Now, the problem with clomid, I want to get back to this, this second ingredient, zuclomiphene, which is not in, of clomiphene, of course, it's just that. So these are isomers, right? So these are, um, you know, kind of mirror images of each other. Uh, and the, again, the uh, enclomiphene is only an estrogen uh, blocker, right? An actual estrogen antagonist and the zuclomiphene stimulates estrogen, right? But also the zuclomiphene, unfortunately, has a very long half-life, much longer than enclomiphene. So enclomiphene, which is the one that we want because it can help us to make testosterone, it can help us to increase hormonogenesis. That kind of says at, at, at a nice level, this is a pill you take, actually. It's not even a shot. It's, a, it's an oral medication. Take it once a day. However, the zuclomiphene has a much longer half-life. So guess what? If you take uh, clomiphene, which has both in there, the enclomiphene will be at this nice stable level and doing its thing, whereas the zuclomiphene, which is the estrogen agonist, starts building up over time, right? And then we get all these estrogenic side effects. And when we stop the medication, these estrogenic side effects last for a while because zuclomiphene has built up in the system. So you cannot take clomid <clears throat> for prolonged periods of time for that reason, right? Um, so again, clomiphene, the end clomiphene, I think, is a very good medication because it can reestablish this. It has been used for quite a while now. Um, there are some companies offering this. Um, I personally have not tried this, but I'm actually curious to do so because I think that's worth trying out. And before I would recommend this to my patients in my clinic, I would probably want to go on it, right? Again, given my testosterone is really low normal, I would say, see if that influences my testosterone in the appropriate measures. And then you can also check in FSH and LH, making sure really that, you know, everything stays uh, fairly, fairly normal. You know, you look at a free testosterone, you look at um, all these kind of uh, values when we do lab tests. 
So um, that's something that I'm actually very interested in. And I've read a lot of the literature about it. And of course, uh, looked into, um, you know, some blogs and patients reporting being on this, how they have done. And most people are very happy with this. So they really increased their testosterone. A lot of times they pretty much doubled it. So let's say someone starts at 500 nanograms per deciliter, so sort of midline, they can go to almost a thousand nanograms per deciliter while keeping their fertility. And I think that's the important point here. So we keep fertility, we keep spermatogenesis, and we keep testosterone levels high. Now, the doses here, this is an interesting thing as well. And these are more anecdotes. So I've looked into what different people are taking. And, you know, there's uh, low doses like 6.25, then there's 12.5 and 25 milligrams. A lot of people, even at the lowest dose, had very good results. Most people were around the 12.5 milligram uh, daily of n and had uh, excellent results. Um, and uh, side effect wise, there was not that much reported. For clomiphene, it's very interesting because of the zooclomiphene, because of the estrogen, um, estrogen agonist zooclomiphene that's in, that's in clomid, there have been rare occurrences of um, uh, eye problems, and these can be quite severe. However, n clomiphene does not have this estrogen agonist in it, and therefore it should not happen. That hasn't been reported, at least in the literature, from what I've found. You know, the usual things, some some nausea, some headaches, all these kind of things possibly. But none of these estrogenic side effects really have been reported with n clomiphene, right? So it's very important, again, to make this distinction. Also, if you go to your doctor, they may not know uh, about n clomiphene and might write you for clomid, which is uh, clomiphene. And I would not suggest to do that for the reasons I've just outlined, because you're going to get 38% of zooclomiphene, which you don't really want to take, right? So uh, I think fairly safe in terms of side effects. Now, this hasn't been used for that long regularly. The question is always, well, can I use this in whatever dose works for me for extended periods of time? And, you know, most of the um, data we have is up to three years, and that seems to be fine. Um, I would argue, though, when you think about it, if you do breaks in between, let's say after six months, you take like a month off, um, you should not have a dramatic drop in your testosterone. I think this is something that might slowly increase to some extent. And then when you start the medication again, it fairly rapidly comes up again. So I think it's safe for most of those medications to take breaks intermittently. And of course, this is something you have to talk to your doctor about. This is a prescription medication, so you, you can't even get this without your physician being on board with this. But the more research you've done on your own, you know, the better it is and the better you can kind of understand, hey, this is something that I really would like to um, get and can we look into this? So I think it's an excellent medication. Again, um, I think the um, side effects are very low. I think it's uh, uh, something that is worth trying after you talk with your physician. And if you have symptoms of low testosterone, and especially for younger men, if you want to preserve fertility, absolutely go for this. If it's primary hypogonadism where your testes just don't work so well anymore, age-related or other issues, and you need testosterone, then that's fine. Then you take testosterone. But it's very important to make this distinction. And if you're not sure which one it is and your physician is not sure which uh, uh, issue it really is, whether it's the testes or whether it's the stimulation from the um, hypothalamus pituitary, then it's worth maybe trying this out, you know, and seeing if this does uh, anything to you. And if not, again, you can always go back on testosterone. There's nothing wrong being on testosterone replacement therapy. So again, I just want people to understand the ramifications of this, you know, and what are the potential risks, the potential risks and side effects, because there are long-term risks, as I've outlined. And if uh, fertility is something that is important to you, and I think it should be important to you, you know, um, having uh, children, you know, um, having a family, I think it's the most important thing that we can that we can have in life. I think this is wonderful. And uh, doing something silly when our testosterone levels are a bit lower and we're in our 20s and 30s and going on testosterone, and kind of decreasing our chance of having children, I think is not a good idea. So um, hopefully this is something that was helpful and educational. If you are on n please um, leave a comment um, or you know uh, um, write about your experiences. I'm very interested in the doses you're on, how this has been going, and also the timeline. How long have you been on it? This would be super helpful. I definitely read all the comments and questions. So please subscribe, leave a comment, and thank you.